Where does your passion for science come from? My passion for science goes back very, very far. Even as a child, I wanted to know how things work. And I was also curious what happens. So I was sitting, we lived in the countryside, in a small castle. It was not private, it was after war. So the castle was free to be, to be used. For my, my father was working there. And I'm, I'm told that I was sitting up there on the second floor of the castle and watching out all the time. As a child with three, four, five years old. And the people in the village thought that I'm kind of crazy. You know, which I'm, which maybe I am, you know, you never know. <laughs> so this is how it started. And, and as I said, I was interested in how things work. I was usually not interesting interested in, in putting them together. Like many, many physicists try to put things together. You know, as soon as you know how it works, why should you put it back together again? You know it already, right? It's, it's, it seems to be curiosity, right? And it seems to be curiosity for everything. Was there a single defining moment when you decided to pursue science? I don't think that there was a single moment which made me dis, uh, decide to go for science. There were various inputs, like my father had given me a microscope when I was 14 years old, and I played with the microscope, you know, and. And I had a fantastic teacher in physics, in gymnasium, as we call it, high school. Uh, and, and, you know, and at the time when the others in my class, the other boys, were talking about girls and all this, I had a friend and we were talking for hours about cosmology and about the Big Bang and this and that. <laughs> this was curiosity, curiosity. Was there a particular person who influenced you? My teacher in physics and mathematics, he was clearly excited about what he was telling us. And that's the most important ingredient in my eyes for a, for a good teacher. Good te he or she can make mistakes and, and, and so it doesn't matter. As long as the person is excited and you see that the whole, the whole soul is behind it. That's enough, that's it. Uh, the, to, to be excited, you cannot fake. Uh, you know, young students, they know immediately what goes on in a, in, a, in a teacher. They know it right away, after 10 minutes, you know. Let me make one point. You know, another feature of a teacher is that the teacher has to take you as a person seriously. Like, I had a teacher in, in another, another field who was very cynical and made jokes about us, but the fact that he made jokes meant that he took you seriously. And, and that was a good teacher too. It is, not, it is not fashionable today to say something like that, but you felt accepted and, he, and the teacher took you so serious that he even tried to, 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 to uh, 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 make fun about you. At least that's the way I saw it. The worst are teachers who don't care. That happens, unfortunately, sometimes. How do you cope with failure? Well, actually, you know, uh, there was only one big failure. There was one experiment which we tried in the, in the about 2000. There was one experiment about 2000 where we, where we tried to do something which was too ambitious at that time. We spent a lot of money and, and the results we got were so complicated that we didn't understand it. So we gave up. Uh, this was the only really big failure in, in, in my academic uh, life, having been too ambitious in terms of, and with my students, you know. And, but otherwise, otherwise you, 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 meet, you meet challenges. There are things which you did not expect, uh, uh, new problems, uh, and you don't know how to solve it right away. But this can all be attacked by essentially stamina, keep going what, 
uh, what you want to do. And most important in my field, in the experiments, talk with your students, your postdocs all the time. Discuss and suddenly somebody has an idea and off we go. What was it like when you first started pursuing science? I, I, I was very lucky, which I found out later, for having been educated in Vienna. Because in Vienna you still had and still have a spirit of openness to very fundamental questions. The idea that something has to be useful is secondary in the Viennese culture. And that was extremely useful for me as I discovered when I came to the US. Okay? And the second point is I had my PhD thesis supervisor uh, was doing experiments on the uh, foundations, fundamental experiments, which were unique at that time. There were maybe two or three others in the world. I didn't realize how unique this was. I was lucky to work in, on, on, that, on that thing. So it's an it's a intellectual environment, which is extremely important. How is science today different from when you first started? How can it be improved? Not that common. And it, it gets worse, actually. I really, it, it get, now, now we have a development that you have, uh, uh, when you want to get money, you have to say what it can be used for. And I said, you know, uh, 30 years ago, when journalists asked me what can this be used for, I said, I can proudly tell you this is not good for anything. We just do it out of curiosity. So, so, so this, this is very important, that you have the possibility to do something out of curiosity. And with today's funding schemes, you are always asked, what is it good for? And you are also asked, what methods you, will you use to do this? In the beginning, I had no idea how to realize uh, the things I wanted to do. And this came slowly. It took years. So, like what to me is my most important experiment is entanglement of more than two particles. We had the idea in the late 1980s and the realization was in the late 1990s. So I really, my appeal is really that funding agencies, universities and so on should be much more open to, to really curiosity-driven research with no application in mind. I will fight for that as long as I'm alive. Not for me, actually, because, but for the young people. The young people need to, they need to be encouraged to, to do this kind of thing. What attitude do you need to be a successful scientist? But there is, yeah, I mean, this attitude uh, is playfulness, personally, and that also means that, like, like uh, myself, I never worried about my career. I never thought about what will I do, where will I get the job. This was just not, not a theme. You know, I worked on this kind of thing because I was curious and I enjoyed it. And the rest came. I think today there's too much worry about what will happen and, and so on and so on. I tell young people, if you find something where you are curious about, where you are excited about, do it. Don't listen to what your supervisor tells you or what other people tell you, because if you are excited about it, you will be always better than the others who are not excited about it. How do you like to spend your free time? I'm in, in my free time, I like to sail. I have a boat on the lake in, in Austria and I love to just be on the boat. You know, this is an old wooden boat, just to be on the boat and fix this or what, that. And so, that's already relaxing. Sailing is then the top. I also like to sail uh, on the, in, in the, sometimes uh, on the Mediterranean with the crew and so on. And I, I think I know why why sailing is so important for me. This is because when you are sailing, 
your complete mind is focused on just what happens on the boat and on the wind and on the waves and all this. There's no possibility for your mind to, to go off and think about the usual daily problems or, or even, the, even the questions, what do you have to solve in science and so on. So it takes your complete person and that, I think, is a kind of recovery to get strength and so on. And the second thing I like to do, the second thing I like to do is I collect old maps and I collect old views. And with the maps, it's a focus on political change. So like, like the a map of the Soviet Union is very interesting to look at today, you know. A map of the British Empire is very interesting to look at. And even uh, way back, you know, 100, 200 years ago, the maps of Europe, you know, like how big Sweden once was, for example, and all these things. These are very instructive. It tells you, it tells you in the end how unimportant some questions are. The, the name of my boat is 42, because this is taken from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You know, there was the question about life, the universe, and everything. And the supercomputer produced the answer which was 42. And my boat is the answer. What was it like talking physics with the Dalai Lama? I visited the Dalai Lama twice for a week in his residence in northern India. And he went to my lab, actually, in, in Austria and looked at the lab. He has a scientific mind, very clear scientific mind. And he asked, asked the right questions. So, so, so we talked about, on the one side, the basic statements of quantum physics. And on the other hand, he told us some of their philosophical findings, not meditation and so on, but some of their philosophical findings, which are quite interesting. It's a very interesting discussion. It's not written up yet, but at some day it has to be written up what came out of it. And what that actually tells me is that there maybe are interesting parallels between Eastern philosophy and what we are doing, but I say maybe, because some of these explanations are wisdom in hindsight. Now I told them, I told the, 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 this, there were some leading uh, uh, Buddhist uh, teachers and, and, and philosophers there also. And, and I told them, when it is said that quantum mechanics has realized this or that, then I, I believe that under one challenge. Tell me one thing which we have not discovered yet, and I go to the lab and check it. This has not happened. What about the future of quantum mechanics excites you? Well, the most important question is why quantum mechanics? Quantum physics is probably the most beautiful mathematical theory humanity ever invented. And it's also the best proven. It's incredible how precise the, the predictions are realized. But as John Clauser said in an interview recently, he doesn't know what's, what goes on. Why? Why do we have this? And I, this is, in my eyes, uh, one of the most important questions. And I think it has to do with uh, what is the role of information versus reality. And there is something which we can, uh, where we can make a breakthrough, I think. And I hope this will happen. I have some ideas about that. And I want to spend the rest of my life on working on these questions. <laughs>